Welcome to a very special edition of the Boxing Hour here on Box Nation. It's all about a tribute to Muhammad Ali. The day of the fight, I'm planning to reveal the round and the minute, and I would tell you the second if I knew how long it would take the referee to get from his position <laughs> to start counting. <down. laughs> I'll ever get back in the ring. Do you all want to see me no. fight again? No. They don't see me. They rather, they rather for me to preach. Yes, welcome. It will be a tribute with a difference. And if you've seen lots of Muhammad Ali stuff since last weekend, you've pro probably watched that three minutes and gone, wow, I've never seen that. Wow, I've never seen that. Because that's what we're trying to do uh, this evening. We're trying to bring you, between now and when we're finished, uh, various things you've not seen. And we're going to hear from one man in particular you've not heard from yet, who we saw in one of those Clips. I'm joined as ever on my sofa here at Box Nation by former WBO Super Featherweight Champion of the World, uh, Barry Jones. Um, Barry, some of those images there are familiar and some of those I'd never seen yeah. before. Everybody, it seems, had seen Muhammad Ali. Now, your first amateur contest was only a couple of years after his last professional contest growing up can you remember guys trying a box not the big names i'm talking about guys in low can you remember guys trying a box like muhammad to be honest it was more about ray leonard by the time i i, I was boxing or he, he was the the alley of his day i guess yeah. you know and but obviously you know we have to, for me ray leonard was my hero so so and his hero was ali mm. so i i very i, I very quickly you know, done my research on Ali and started to watch Muhammad Ali because I wanted to be everything what Sugar Ray Leonard was mm -hmm. growing up. You know, literally all the wrongs had done shadow boxing in the middle being Sugar Ray Leonard mm -hmm. and then thinking, oh, hang on, this guy's hero is Muhammad Ali. And so I knew who Ali was, but when I actually sat down and watched him for the first time, really watched him, I thought, this is... <laughs> is this a wine? You almost think he was so good that his fight almost looked fixed he was so good. You know, <laughs> picking the round, the way he just he played with people mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden he'd, switch, he'd flick a switch and he was all business. All business indeed. Barry Jones will be with me between now and the end of the show. We'll hear from some great people, but we'll also see some unique short films and one or two slightly longer films. It'll be a lovely show. Thanks for sticking with me. But we're going to start with some big names talking about the biggest name of all. Well, I, I liked Ali because he talked a lot. Ali did a lot of talking. And I listened to um, Sonny Liston, he fought Sonny Liston at the time. I listened to that because he was very quiet. All he wanted to do was say, I'll knock you out, boy. That's why he didn't say too much or nothing. And, but I like Ali because he always made a lot of rhymes, made poems, and uh, what he was saying. So, um, you know, that intrigued me a little bit. 
you know, at eight years old, my goal was to be the heavyweight champ of the world. Even at eight years old and, you know, weighing 65 pounds, you know, that's the goal that my trainer told me. He said, you know, you could be like Ali. It really gave me thrill every day to go in the gym and be able to say, hey, Ali, how you doing? To be able to get in the ring with Ali and let him try to throw punches and land punches and for me to try to duck the punches. Uh, it was, there, was, there was great moments every day that I was able to get up. You know, that gave me, that, that gave me a lot of pleasure. Me and my mother used to watch Muhammad Ali in front of the TV, and I said, boy, you know, this is something I wanted to do. I wanted to be a champion just like him. I used to sit back in the, in the back and just watch him and watch how people accept him, how he did things, you know, and that was a great feeling just to be around him. I um, mean, made me better. I didn't have to fight him or box him or anything. Just being around him made me want to be like him. So uh, it gave me great pleasure. Gave me great pleasure. Lennox Lewis there, of course, will be one of the pallbearers when Ali is buried on Friday in Louisville. There is a function taking place today, Thursday, at the Freedom Hall in Louisville, where he had his first ever fight. And we'll talk to a man a bit later in the show, Gene Curoy, who is there and has been there for many years. Uh, arguably the closest living human to Mohammed, you heard from the three big men there uh, in various ways, yeah. all came into contact with Ali, the training camp and a fight for Larry and just being ringside. Uh, Ali was ringside, for obviously, for Evander Holyfield and Lennox Lewis. All heavyweights pay homage to him, Barry, all they, of them. They do, look, there's, there's three, not just good heavyweights, three great heavyweights there. Larry Holmes, in particular, was, was phenomenal and, and his jab is probably thanks to, to Muhammad Ali, all the training camps he did with Ali, learning about that, that rapier, that flicking, beautiful jab that Ali had. And, and, and Larry Holmes was known in the end for having such a, a beautiful left hand. And I guess, I guess he probably stole that a little bit off, off the great Muhammad Ali. Well, he certainly did enough rounds with him. Now, the first time we actually uh, saw Ali after the, the Rome Olympics was when he was on the top of the Empire State Building with Harry Carpenter, who took him there in 1963 before his fight at Madison Square Garden with Doug Jones. Cassius, you call yourself the greatest and this building is the highest in the world. Is it your ambition to become as famous as this building? Well, it is my ambition to become as famous as this building, if not more famous. Are you still plugging the line that you are the greatest heavyweight alive? I'm the greatest heavyweight on two feet today. I'm the only man who calls the exact round in which my opponent will fall months before the fight. I'm predicting that Doug Jones will fall in six. And I might have to cut it in three. I don't know right now. Aren't you afraid that one of these days uh, somebody like Sonny Liston is going to make you pay for all these rude things you say about him? Well, I'm gunning for that big old ugly bear, and I'll get him as soon as I annihilate Doug Jones. <laughs> what, what? Uh, I predicted eight on Sonny Liston, but he kept popping off about he's going to shove his uh, glove so far down my throat until it's going to take a doctor to cut it out. It made me angry. I had to cut that prediction from six to eight. What gave you this idea of uh, predicting the I round like I mean, from like eight this? to six. <laughs> what first gave you the idea of uh, forecasting the round, of predicting the round in which an opponent is going to fall? Well, uh, I, opponents are gonna fall. Well, I, noticed, I noticed the fight game is dying today. And uh, when I started fighting, I said that I don't want, be a, don't want to be another sad fight and I'm going to do something about it. What I'll do is I will tell everybody what round that I will win in. And so far, I've been lucky enough to do it. And the day that one calls around on me, I'm catching the next jet for your country. <laughs> Your ambition, I believe, is to be the youngest ever heavyweight champion. Now, how long have you got to go in well, order to uh, do this? That is right. Floyd Patterson won the World Heavyweight Championship one month before he was 22. So that leaves me about two months before I'm 22. I just had a birthday, January the 17th. I have about uh, eight months to do that. And after Liston beats Patterson, I hope, and then after I uh, annihilate Doug Jones, Liston will be my meat. Aren't you afraid that one day this uh, bubble is going to burst, that you're not going to be able to predict uh, the thing right, that you're going to be wrong? Well, What's going to happen then? It is possible that I, uh, I will miss, I have mixed, missed one or, one or two predictions, but uh, it is possible that I will miss a prediction. But if I do miss a prediction, or if I do mess up, it's best to get paid for it. All I want to do is to get the people in the house, and then whatever's going to happen will happen. But supposing you don't become heavyweight champion of the world, aren't you going to find all this publicity you've had a little bit embarrassing at this stage? Well, you may say it would be a little embarrassing, but like I told you, if I should ever, the only way I can't be the heavyweight champion is that uh, I'll get beat. 
And then when that happened, I won't be I won't be here, nowhere around this country to be embarrassed. I've got a rhyme for you. It's fun to talk to Cassius Clay, but now's the time to call it a day. How's that? Report and don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> and feet show it. <laughs> Thank you, Cassius. Thank you very much. That's good. And not a promotional T-shirt or minder or security guard in sight. Just Rachman Ali at his brother Muhammad's side and Harry Carpenter in fine form. I have a bone for you, Mr Jones. Um, <laughs> He was a showman, it was natural, but he also worked at it with the predictions and the poems, Barry. Yeah, of course he did. I think, you know, I, I think he was a, a learned man in many ways. You know, he read a lot of books, especially more so when he, when he converted to Islam, then he really became a, become a student of, of, of literature. But you know, he used to, he'd do his homework. He would really do it. And, and I think he was the first modern athlete in many ways that he learned that it's not just about being good at your sport, it's how you sell yourself. And, and I think he was the... The master of that, and I think every sportsman in, in every sport has got him to thank for that. Certainly has got him to thank for that. In fact, before he did win the uh, world title from Liston, which came a little bit after uh, he was hoping it would, uh, he actually released the full album of his uh, poems, which is quite fantastic because it's got this brilliant introduction, classical music, and an MC introduces him as Cassius Clay from Louisville. It's really fantastic. You should try and get hold of a copy of that. I might uh, might run some of that. Uh, one of the, When we're going through the night, we might run it one night. Anyway... The big rival, the main rival, it was, of course, the three fights with Mr. Joe Frazier. They were brutal, they were beautiful, they were unforgettable. I'm no longer playing, I'm boxing. This man comes in, anybody can hit him, all his farm partners are ramming him every day, and they are nothing to me, no class, right. no footwork, no speed. When I get those little bitty gloves on and be real serious and no plan, no Wonder standing what they're gonna corner, put on me. just sticking and moving, all he's got is some hooks. and they What prove, kind of gloves I'm gonna have? That he, I, he can't stop me. What kind of gloves I'm gonna have stops on? Me. He, last you answer night, that. Man's asking what kind of gloves I'm gonna have you on? Have on the same you gonna have on last time. Gloves. What are they going to put on You got the same thing on last Let's time. Let's have one or something? Yeah, that sounds so That's same, another crazy question. Everybody know he's going to have on gloves like All me. Right, never he's talking like that's like another that. point. Can I ask crazy. you a question? What am I going to have on? Okay, you oh, prove you it. Make, you you make, have you on said, gloves like me. We point. always have on right. the same. All right, right. just get the one now. We ain't got to be Get in there, Michael. Get. You're coming very close. Watch it. Watch it. Watch it. Watch it. Watch it. Watch it. No, your trainers are fading. Don't back out of here. Put your coat down. Don't back out of here. Don't back down. Come on. You could hit him accidentally. I can hit him accidentally. What do you think I'm trying to do? Why, anything you like. Oh, I just can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. Oh, I want you. World Heavyweight Championship Boxing live and exclusive on Box Nation. July the 9th from Manchester. Will it be revenge for Vladimir Klitschko in his rematch with Tyson Fury? That is going to be live and exclusive on Box Nation on July the 9th. Now, uh, today, Thursday and tomorrow, Friday, Muhammad Ali is back in Louisville, his hometown, for the very last time. It's a town with a checkered past, a mixed town. It is the town where Muhammad Ali started to fight, or as he was known then, Cassius Marcellus Clay. Louisville was primarily known as a wealthy southern town, a favorite location for conventions. It was famous as the home of Kentucky Chicken, the Kentucky Derby, and the source of Kentucky Bourbon. But in 1960, it became more famous as the home of the Louisville Lip. I get a feeling here that I don't get no other country, no other city here in the States. These are my people. I can identify with them. They remember me when I was called Gigi, my nickname, when I was called Cassius Clay. They knew me when I went to school, when I... Uh, rode around in motorcycle gangs and stole bicycles and did everything that other little kids do, peeped in windows and, and my first girlfriends are still around, they remember it. 
and I have a feeling here that I can't get nowhere else. I paid much money for homes in New Jersey, then I moved to uh, places like Houston, Texas, then I moved to Miami, then I moved to Philadelphia, and now I'm in Chicago, but I still don't get the feeling of serenity and peace and satisfaction as I do here in Louisville, because this is home, and we all know how we like home. Everybody watching this interview know that there's a certain feeling when you're going around home, the same old pool rooms, the coffee shop or the bar where the fellas hang out and you know them all and uh, they knew you before you made it or before you became who you are. It's just a good feeling being at home. Who were the men who put you on the road to success as a boxer? Well, the first fellow I met who started me was Joe Martin, the white police officer here, then Fred Stoner. A uh, black fella in Louisville, Kentucky. Joe Martin had a TV show called Tomorrow's Champions. He had the connection and everything. And the Fred Stone was a black trainer. Grace Community Center in another part of town trained boys in the poverty and the ghettos in the basement. He had all the skill, the black fella. He had the best fighters with no connection. I trained with Joe Martin at 6 o'clock and then slip over to Fred Stoner's gym and learn all the skills. And then I go back to Joe Martin and get all the TV fights, but I slip to Fred Stoner's to get the real knowledge. So where I got my real knowledge on boxing was from Fred Stoner, but from Joe Martin, I uh, got the uh, publicity. Ali is returning to the school in the neighborhood where he grew up. To honor the man who began his career here, they've built a new gym and they've named it after him. Joe Martin. <laughs> Later on, he's going to raise money for the school by boxing an exhibition bout with his friend Jimmy Ellis, another boy from Louisville who became world heavyweight champion. They may be going to pull their punches in the fight, but Ali never pulls his punches when it comes to publicity. I didn't come to Louisville to waste my time. I'm coming to Louisville to show the people I'm true to the champ, and you are a top-notch contender. You won the world's best heavyweights. I've been after you for a long time. You beat me once when I was an amateur. I beat you, and we'll settle it tomorrow night. Well, we're gonna see. We'll, we'll see. settle the whole thing. We'll, 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 we'll straighten up. Get all your brothers and all of them together. Ain't nothing gonna help you. All of you come out tomorrow, because I'm going to put something on your nose, boy. We'll see. We'll see. Two of the world's best heavyweights from Louisville, Kentucky. Two of the world's greatest fighters. Former heavyweight champion and the present heavyweight champion of the whole world. Wow. Come on, suckers. Joe Martin, the Louisville policeman who introduced him to boxing, puts on the golden gloves so that some of the older pupils can take a crack at the champ. I'm going to show you I'm the world's greatest fighter. Put the gloves on these suckers. I'm going to show you how I play with these kids. He look like he's good, don't he? Watch what I do to him. Watch me play with him. I'm going to show you something, boy. I'm going to see what you, what you got. Hmm. Up. Yeah, show me what you got. Show me what you got. Hmm. Show me what you got. Hmm. Yeah. Keep punching. Hmm. Ain't got nothing. Hmm. Ain't got nothing. Hmm. I'm giving him huh? hmm. Hmm. Give me a break. Hmm. Ain't got nothing. First time I saw him, he was approximately 12 years old. In fact, he was 12 years old, and I was running the gymnasium over at Columbia Gym. And of course, I was a police officer. In fact, I just retired in December, and I handled all the boxing for the city of Louisville. And uh, someone had stole his bicycle up above where they was having some kind of community thing where they give prizes away to youngsters. And while he had parked his bike out, someone stole it, and uh, he wanted to find a police officer to report it to, and someone told him about me downstairs. So he came downstairs where the gymnasium was and saw the gym, and he was all hostile, wanted to whip somebody. And so I said, you never fight 
if you don't know how. And I said, have you anybody ever taught you how to fight? And he said, no. And I said, well, you should come down here and learn how to fight first before you start picking fights. So that was the beginning of it. He started coming to the gym, and he was a very religious trainer. And he got so he was there when I got there, and he was there when I left. He was 12 years old then, and I, at that time, was putting on a local television show here in Louisville. And I had uh, amateur bouts every Saturday afternoon. And the first bout I put him in, he was 12 years old and weighed 87 pounds. That's how he got started. Throw you one, two, boom, you get him back here. Don't drop him down. You throw it out, don't drop that hand down to bring it back. Off the shoulder, back on the shoulder. The right hand, pivot, bring it back on guard. Okay, move it. But, as Ali says, it was Fred Stoner who instilled the basic skills, something he's still doing today. For the Muhammad Ali School of Boxing is his school, and his former pupil has returned to support him. Drop right to the body. Let's have it. As a schoolboy, Ali graduated at 376th out of a class of 391. But the education he received from Fred Stoner proved more beneficial. Boxing is more than a sport in Louisville. It's a passport to get out of the ghetto. Bring the man's guards up, you drop here and you drive there. There's your target, here. You don't want to be hitting over there. You jab and set the man up here. A split second, his hands go up to protect himself, then you drop and bang into that body. See what I mean? All right, let's go. Come on. You hit me too hard and kick your teeth out. Come on. Okay. Come on. Come on. We had developed up a crack bunch of boys because they fought the whole year and trained the whole year. So the way Clay got into it, there's usual boys wait until way a month or so before the tournament. Then they go in and not knowing, they think they can get ready and compete in that time. Well, this is fine if all the other boys are just like you. But as it happened, they ran into our boys that year. That was our first... Uh, really the first time in as a whole group into the tournament. And the boy that upset Cassius, uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, is still living in the East End today, named Jimmy uh, Davis. Of course, he didn't grow into a heavyweight course. At that time, uh, Ali was a little, what we called the peanut division, you know, the younger kids. And he was a good boy, but he hadn't met experienced boys. And his mother and father was ringside, and when they saw what happened, they were just completely disgusted behind it. And they raised a lot of sand about boys having to meet boys of that caliber, so that well-trained. So they asked the kids where they were training, and the kids told them, and they came over and wanted to know if they could bring uh, Muhammad Ali up there. So uh, naturally, we made him welcome. And he and his brother both came up, and they stayed with us uh, well until uh, he went and won his Olympics. And after winning his Olympics, uh, he came back when he started his pro career. We trained him for his first few fights. He came back home for that. Before he won his gold medal, Ali had fought 108 amateur bouts and lost only eight. Then he signed a six-year contract with a syndicate of Louisville millionaires, headed by William Faversham, Jr. So I'd seen him quite a lot as a kid. Gangling, youngster, no punch, but able to flit around. So I got a hold of um, a, a black man. I guess is the word I have to use now, um, who uh, worked for me, very bright young fellow. And I said, do you know Cassius by any chance? And he said, yes, he did. And I said, well, I'd like you, George, to arrange a meeting between Cassius and me. And if he wants his family there or anybody else, I'd be fine. So we had the meeting at my house, his mother and father, his brother, Rudy, and uh, so I had a program worked out and explained the program, and uh, they were impressed by it. Plus which, they knew the type of people that were in the group were not the type of people who uh, needed to make money. Well, he got, of course, all training expenses. We took care of all that. He got um, so many dollars uh, a month. Well, let's call it $400, enough so that he could eat, so forth. And then he got 50% of the gate, because we didn't have very big gates for quite a while. But in February 1964, Ali ensured himself big gates for the rest of his professional life when he removed the world heavyweight title from Sonny Liston. Television. Yeah, you show me light and give me a hug. Yeah, yeah. 
So I visited my mother yesterday and my father, and, and uh, they don't get along too well. Everybody's got problems. My father's 62, my mother's about 54. She wants a divorce, so I gotta help her get a divorce. You agree with that, do you? <laughs> yeah, if they don't have no peace and always fussing and never get along, and my father is always, uh, I don't know, just little hang-ups, they just can't make it, so and I'll try to reconcile them, but if we can't make it, it's best to separate so she can have some peace and she don't have to worry and suffer like she did years ago because I have the finance to take out of misery. Yeah. When you talk to your old friends and meet them again, do you have a, a lot in common still, or have you grown apart from them, do you? Well, we've grown apart, and they all have families, and you know, they're married, and they got fat, and, and some got prettier, some got uglier. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, some moved to other cities, and things are different, and we're grown now, and we're getting old, and we all got little children, and, you know, that's the way life goes. Say you'd never gone into boxing. Would you have stayed here? Would you have grown up here? Probably have stayed, good question. Probably, I was always adventurous. I probably left here, went to another city. Probably, uh, uh, I probably been a Muslim minister. I was always, always black orientated. I've always a freedom fighter. I got with some black organization and started pushing it. Uh, uh, I didn't have the type of mind to work at the post office or be a cab driver, a hotel waiter, or a bell captain. I wasn't that type of fellow. I was always, I would have done something. I would have been good or top notch or something else. If it was a garbage man, I'd been the world's greatest garbage man. I'd be able to dump more cans of garbage in 10 minutes more than anybody. I'd been the world's greatest whatever I'd done. And I think that I would have met some real pretty girl probably in another city, got married, and uh, got me a little apartment, a house and got wrapped up in some movement and been some type of freedom fight or something. I told you I was gonna come back one day and get you this though. I always told you I was coming back. You thought you were... That was a lovely uh, film there with Muhammad Ali back in Louisville. Sparring, of course, with Jimmy Ellis there briefly and then sparring with someone else who called him with a cracking left hook. Some absolutely fantastic stuff. Now, one man that been back in Louisville many, many times with Mohammed and was there earlier today. There's a man called Gene Kiraway. Gene Kiraway, if you don't know who he is, take a close look at all of Ali's fights and there he is. He's a white guy, in a, generally in a safari suit with not a perm but naturally curly hair, as he keeps telling me. He carried a couple of coffins. He carried Muhammad Ali's mother and Muhammad Ali's father. And I had to speak to Gene earlier because he was making his way to the Freedom Hall for the first of two days of ceremonies. And the first question I, I asked Gene was quite simple. Gene, I said, what's the atmosphere like in Louisville right now? Well, the people in Louisville are so kind and considered, you know, they're getting their big hero home. And uh, everybody, you know, is so great in uh, welcoming home their hero. Uh, not only a hero to Louisville, but a, a hero to the people of planet Earth. And uh, right now, uh, his mother told me one time, if we can make the, the planet Earth a better place, then we found it. And her son has done that. Uh, thinking back over it, you know, I said, Muhammad right now, he went home to heaven. And he's our gift to God. But when he gets up there, I know St. Peter's going to meet him at the gate. And he's going to tell Ali, let's take a selfie. And I need you to sign this boxing glove and go in there and God's waiting for you. <laughs> oh, and Gene, that's fantastic. His, he's up there with his parents and oh. you know, all the fighters. And I'm sure he's enjoying himself. And he has peace at last. Gene, you go back to Louisville quite often. You introduced me to Ruckman all those years ago, but you also were back there twice at the funerals of, of, uh, of Muhammad and Ruckman's parents. It must be bittersweet for you being back in Louisville again. Well, I was a pallbearer for his mom and dad, and no one, you know, none of the people close to Ali other than myself and the family. So I'm being respected by all of the family, and it's a good thing. And you know what, you know what is sad about that? That isn't sad itself. What is that is about saying goodbye, yeah. and that's what I'm here. This is my last goodbye to Muhammad Ali. We all have to die, but there's an old Chinese proverb said that we're never dead as long as we're remembered, and Muhammad Ali 
will be remembered many, many times. The Gallup Post survey, uh, years ago they took a survey, the most recognizable man on planet Earth, and that was Muhammad Ali. And I witnessed that when we were in Zaire, Africa. I took his family and friends out on a safari, and we went out to the jungle to see the animals, and uh, everybody out there knew Muhammad Ali, but they didn't know who the press United States was, you know. But uh, Ali Boumaye, Ali Boumaye. Oh, beautiful. Gene, let me ask you this, you're, you're, finally. Um, it's obviously been a hard week for you. Um, what are you going to do after the funeral, Gene? Are you going to stay in Louisville? Are you going to go back to your home no, in Las Vegas? I'm going to go back home. I'm going to go back home and charge the batteries and relax and... You know, every night when I lay down, I think about the memories we had. And one time Muhammad Ali told me, he said, sometimes I think about the good times and I start to laugh and my wife thinks I'm crazy, you know. But Lani Ali, she did a great job, and her sister Marilyn taking care of Ali. Ali was a true champ in and out of the ring, and Ali's wife was a true champ taking care of him, you know, when he was living and handling everything after his death. But she deserves a lot of compliments, and uh, his children are here. They're all here. But what's sad about death is we should get together when we're alive, not wait till after death. It would have been a nice if there were, everybody was here when he was alive and hitting on all cylinders. That would have been spectacular. That would have been spectacular. Gene, as ever, you've been a friend to me for many years. Thank you so much for your time, Gene. Well, God bless you. And listen, and thank you always for keeping Muhammad in the public and in good standings and all. And and Muhammad loved the U.K., and the people of the U.K. loved Ali. I remember when he fought Joe Bugner, he did a press conference, and he said, all my fans in, in London and the U.K., you can cheer for your guy, but after the fight, when I whoop him, don't forget, come back to me. They certainly did go back to him. Uh, Gene Kilroy there, uh, Barry. No one has been as close to Mohammed over the years, and no one has done more for him than Gene. Well, you get, no, not at all. And you get people who've met Ali, and I think he was such an engaging character, he made you feel special, so it seems. So everyone who's met him or been around him for a little time tend to have a story that they, how close they were to Ali. And I tend to think not everyone can be that close to him, but this, this is a guy here who we know for a fact. And I've, and I've sat next to you when you've talked to him previously, and some of the stories he's, he's told you about Ali and how, how, how much he loved him, you could hear it in his voice. This is a guy who was more than just a, just a business partner, more than just a, an acquaintance. This is a real, a real a lifelong friend, and that's a, it's a sad day for him. That's a key word there, because there's many tributes that have been on radio and have been on TV and have been in the papers. One word you don't use is loved him. That man loved him. As, as an incredibly close friend. If you watch the Rumble in the Jungle, Gene's the first guy that gets in the ring and there's this real melee. Once uh, Gene gets to Muhammad, he talks to him and Muhammad turns to him and says, Gene, let me sit down, let me sit down. It's too hot, I can't breathe. And then the rest of the corner jump in, jump in around Gene and jump in and around Ali and you see Gene's face change to terror because he knows, he cares that much about his friend. It's not about celebrations and sticking the guy on his shoulders or sticking him in the corner so he can wave to the crowd and wave the belt. He knows at that point that his man, his cl close friend, a man he loves, is close to exhaustion and collapse himself. And you see Gene's face, it's a look of terror. Anyway, more coming up. Hope you're enjoying this tribute here. More coming up after the break. European Championship Boxing this weekend, live on Friday night on Box Nation from 7 o'clock from York or Enzo Macronelli against Dimitri Kucci, the European Cruiserweight Championship. There's also boxing on, on Thursday night, actually, at York or. In fact, following this show, if you're watching this show live, you can pop down to York or and see some live boxing. That's Friday, but the big fight this weekend is on Saturday with the brilliant Ukrainian... Vasily Lomachenko, two gold medals, two world amateur championships, and he's aiming to win two world titles at two different weights when he fights Roman Martinez, live and exclusive on Box Nation at 2 o'clock Sunday morning, so very late Saturday night. Martinez and Lomachenko.
Zinchenko. Now, Muhammad Ali eventually set up this fantastic training camp at Deer Lake where there were these enormous boulders with the hand-painted uh, names of world champions. And it was where the chef cooked the most fantastic food and the accommodation was brilliant and the atmosphere was absolutely fantastic. But what the sparring partners really liked was waiting until Muhammad was in bed and waiting until the various trainers were in bed. And then they'd slip into the local town where they had a fine old time. A fine old time. I'm not going to say too much about that. Anyway, this is a beautiful walk around Deer Lake with the champ as our guide. I built this place about, about uh, four years ago. I started building. And now I'm adding on to it little, little things like this old wagon. Old antique instruments like this. We just... We just bought it and fixed it up, and decoration, and something to set on. Built a gymnasium first and put a trailer beside it, a house trailer. And then we had hotel bills, so I built my own cabins for the fighters to stay in. Then we had eating bills, so I built my own kitchen around here. And then we got these rocks right here. Trainer Angelo Dundee, rock here. Archie Moore, Joe Lewis, Gene Tunin, Jerry Quarry, Frazier, Liston. Uh, Sugar Ray Robinson, Rocky Graziano, Willie Pep, Kid Gavilan. I have a lump of coal in the back, a big piece of lump of coal with Jack Johnson's name written on it. And uh, these cabins and things you see, we built all this from the ground up. And I always, as a kid, wanted to train in a tr real training camp with the logs and the rocks and the trees and the woods. And we had so many trees here until uh, you couldn't see none of this view. If you can swing your camera around there, you'll see a big, beautiful view out there. All of that there is a uh, uh, view, view. I couldn't see none of that until I chopped it down. My wife's got to go, go on, darling. She's going to do a shopping center and spend my money. I'll see you later. Be good. She's going to spend my money. She loves to spend my money. She's got credit cards and everything. This is the kitchen right here. I built this. This holds about 20 people for dinner, lunch, breakfast. Then I always wanted an Abraham Lincoln type log cabin. If you can throw your camera right over there, that's my old antique log cabin that's built from bridge timbers. That's an old cabin I had built. It cost me a good little piece of change, but I liked it and I built it. And this here is a fireplace where in the wintertime we come out and we burn logs and make campfires. And so this is the first and the only unique camp for boxing. This is a real fight camp. First one in the world of the kind I can boast. There's not another camp in the world built just for boxing. Over here I have a bell that I ring every day. Every morning at five o'clock when the fellows are not up on time, I come out and I ring my bell. This big bell looks like the Liberty Bell. Got old antique wagon here to go along with the scenery and atmosphere here. We hook a horse up to this sometime and take a ride. But this is my bell. If you want to take a picture of that bell. Up on the hill there, if you throw your camera up there, there are the cabins. The fellas come running out every morning and they got to be up to run. We run four and five miles a day. This is my brother here, Rahman Ali. He just, he just got up. He likes to sleep and eat. He just got up. He come to get a comb. He works hard, so that's why he's got to sleep and eat. He works so hard. I put him all to work. The comb should be in the restroom now. If it ain't, ask, some, ask somebody in the kitchen first. And usually, I don't have time to do what I want to do, like going out with my kids. I got a mobile home setting over there with beds and everything on it. I don't have a chance to go out and do the things I want to do. So most of my time is spent training because my life in boxing is short, four or five more years at the most. And then I'll do the things that I want to do, like cut the grass, go out with the family, go to the beach, or whatever I want to do. I can't do that now, so my time now is just spent training because I fight so regular. He fights so regular, and that was his base. Some amazing sparring sessions, some legendary sparring sessions there. And the one thing about Ali is you never hear, you never hear about cutting corners. You never hear about no. underpreparing. 
Well, he, was, he was a showman and he acted the clown at times and he, he all, all this bravado, but the one thing he did do was live the life in many ways. And he trained hard, he ate right, as you see, because you know, their own chefs, their own cantina, there. So he ate the right foods and, he, and he, listen, he knew everything about being in shape, about being in the right condition to perform. So he knew with all, all the showmanship, all the, the guests the, the predicting the rounds, that was all the, the tinsel, all the glitter, but actually you know, becoming a champion is, is what, what the work you do in the gym, and he did it better than anyone. Now, Barry, let's try and put to bed one or two of the myths that surround various things that happened at that place. I can't go into the X-rated <laughs> stuff that happened once when he was kipping, but Larry Holmes and Roy Williams, some of the stuff was unbelievable. Um, the great story about the black eyes that Tim Witherspoon <laughs> and Larry Holmes managed to get, they both claim... Will you tell part of the story? Go on, you tell Well, well they both claim that they, they never, ever... Ever, we never washed their face after they got a black eye off, off Ali, but I, I don't know whether it's... it's uh... So so you think they're both fibbing? Well, I, I just think it happened to one of them, but the other one just told the story first, probably, mm. and then they run with it. So you maybe get them two in a room, and then them two... Uh, oh, they still, got some un, it out. they still got some unfinished <laughs> business. According to Tim, he still beat him. And the reason why Tim fought so, fo so ferociously against Larry was because Larry Holmes had beaten Muhammad Ali so badly. But, but you, you know this for sure, that they would be competitive. Oh, outrageous no, one, one, to keep a job, but two, to impress the great man himself. Yeah. You know, you want to yeah. you want to be in that environment. You no, know, just uh, we look at the, you know, success breeds success. So being around a, a great boxer like that, you know, you're only going to benefit from it. If you want an incredible, truly incredible story, post the rumble in the jungle, or something that happened at Deer Lake. Look up a story I wrote uh, about a year ago, 18 months ago, about a guy called Roy Williams. It is such an incredible story. You'll actually think it's pure. It's absolutely invented. It's not. It's all true. Now, the woman you saw there wandering around and uh, threatening to go off and spend all of Muhammad's uh, money, and she's even got credit cards, which was a beautiful line, uh, was uh, formerly known as Belinda, uh, but a uh, uh, name once she converted to Islam and married Muhammad was uh, Khalila Ali. Now, Thomas Hauser, who wrote the definitive book, or put the, pulled together the definitive book on Muhammad Ali, The Life and Times of Muhammad Ali, which is the only, the only book really worth having on Ali. It's absolutely legendary. He sat down with Khalila Ali to go over certain aspects of their, I think it was about 10 years they had together. How did people manipulate Ali through the years? Once they find out his weakness, they got him. And I know I, I, I would never be able to win that battle. What was his weakness? Sex. It's his weakness. When did you become aware that there were other women? Uh, there was always other women. Uh, but that, that's to be expected. That's what I was prepared for. That's no problem. I was prepared for that. That was going to be, if my husband was going to be anything big, I mean, I wouldn't want to marry a man that nobody wanted. So I knew I was going to have to go through that. I knew the bigger he got, the worse, harder it's going to be for him because he's not the strongest man in the world when it comes to that kind of thing. When we was in town for the Joe Frazier fight, here I am refrain, reframing from my husband so he can be strong. You know how you do. You have to stay away from him. So he have the fighting and they get that energy and he have the extra adrenaline. And I asked everybody in the crew, Boondini and all, where's Ali? Nobody knows where he is. I said, now you know what? Something's wrong with that picture. Because everybody knows always where he is. So I said, I'm going to call Gene Kilroy because I know Gene Kilroy, he'll tell me the truth. I called Gene Kilroy. A lady answered the phone. Hello? So I said, I speak to Gene Kilroy. Who? I said, Gene Kilroy. And Ali said, I heard his voice, hang up the phone, was telling me he ain't here. I go, what? I said, look, put Ali on the phone. What? I said, put Ali on the phone. Tell him his, this is his wife. Ali gets on the phone. What you talking about? What you talking about? I said, Ali, what, what are you doing? I ain't, ain't what you think. I said, you know what? Forget about it. I'm coming up to the room. And your woman better be gone. And I go up there. 
Well, that's Gene Kirwa's girlfriend. I said, yeah, right. Okay. I come up to the room. Ali is so dumb. He He's still in the room with the girl. He in the bed with no clothes on. You think you would at least put your clothes on before I came to the room, right? And I look down and there's a steak knife on the floor and a plate. And I take the steak knife, go in the room. I say, okay, this is it. I'm killing you right now. It's over. I'm done with you. You're going to bring a room right here in the hotel where I'm restraining from you so you can fight, and you're going to get an ugly woman at that. And she's ugly. I said, okay, you leave. I'll take care of him. So I made her leave. I said, you mentioned this, you're dead. So Ali comes. I tell you what, promise me you don't mention none of this happened, because this does not happen. This did not happen. If you ever mention this, this here to me, I'm going to hurt you. What, 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 what? Ah. And I walked out the room. And I went to, I just got on the elevator and just went to any floor and I just hit a button. I got off, and there was these hassocks sitting next to these windows, and I just sat down and had a good cry by myself. I cleaned up my tears and, 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 and went back to my kids in the room, and I said, oh, this, this, something's wrong here. And Ali came to the room and said, I'm sorry. I said, I, 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 don't, I don't know what you're talking about. I just don't know what you're talking about. I said, I'm getting ready to fight. You go, go do your fight thing. And I'm, what? I don't need you. I don't need, OK. You sure don't. And when the fight's over and you lose, ain't nobody going to be in the room but me and my mom and my daddy. And your daddy, probably. And that's it. All these boondinis and all your binghams and all your whatever, they ain't gonna be there. Nobody likes a loser, man. You, I don't, I don't need you. I've been fighting all my life, brother. Okay, you're on your own. I'm done. I went black, all right? Whew. So My Life with Ali with Thomas Hauser will be on Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock. Uh, on Box Nation. That is an exclusive extended uh, interview that Mr. Hauser conducted with uh, Carlila Camacho Ali. Uh, she was married to Ali when she was 17 years of age, I think in 1967. Wife number two. We heard Gene Kilway mentioned there by her. We also heard Gene Kilway when he was uh, talking to me earlier on, praising the work that Lonnie Ar Ali um, Muhammad Ali's uh, wife at the time of his death, praising how she and her sister had cared for Ali all of those years. Um, he held his hands up for certain things. You know, he, 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 ne he, never, sh he never shunned away he, he from being exposed if he was in trouble for anything. He never said he was perfect. Yes, he, he, in fact, he, that's what he, he said. said, I'm not perfect. He never said he was the greatest man. He said he was the greatest boxer. Mm -hmm. No, I don't know whether he was. He's the great. He's the great. He's the greatest sportsman that ever lived. But no, he never. He never. You know, he never sort of made excuses for his for his his faults. He said that's what makes me who I am. But I'm always. He already did say I'm always striving to be better. That's what he used to teach everyone. He, he go to, into schools, which he? he did all the time develop over the years. Yeah, of course. I think he got better as he, as he went along. As we all do. You learn your. You learn through your life. You know, by your mistakes. Mm -hmm. But you learn as you get older in life. Of course you do. But. Mm -hmm. Listen, you know, he, he did things he wasn't probably proud of, but that's what, but that's what makes him a man, not a god. Some lovely things that we've highlighted in this tribute here, uh, Barry, and, I, and I'd like to think, uh, if I may say so myself, we've found some lovely stuff that's previously not been seen, not just the Kalila Ali stuff, some beautiful I think, stuff. I think getting hold of Gene Kilroy is brilliant because th that's a man who, you know, a man, one of the only men alive now who knew Ali inside out and knew him personally, you know, a real connection with him. And that. can recall it. And can recall it, yeah, that's right. And I think it, it, to listen to him, I can listen to him tell a story to Ali all day mm -hmm. and it's... Uh, you know, it's been a privilege to listen to him, and it really has. And, and this and just underlines mm. what a great man Ali was. And will there ever be another Muhammad Ali? It's, it's hard to think that it is in this day and age. Mm. No, I, I think that time has passed. And I don't know, and I've not Googled it, I'd like to know what happened to those rocks, especially the <laughs> large black one with Jack Johnson's name on it. I've not Googled it, but, you know, It always makes you upset to think somebody bought that land and just knocked it all down and built a, a big, massive, posh house mm. where you think that would, be, that would be a museum for, for Muhammad. 
Yeah, something some things happen like that, don't they? You know, so, you know, some things like that that should have been restored, they just slip through a gap, then they're gone, and then it's too yeah. late. With Graceland, where Elvis is yeah. from, of course, of course, great friends of Ali, they kept it quick. They did. They kept it. But the only the one thing that never that never that never go away is the memory of Ali. Mm. As Kilroy said, you no, know, you're never really dead if you if you live in people's memories, and Ali will be remembered. Forever in people's hearts and in people's memories, uh, there is going to be two days of celebrations, and that's the right word in Louisville on Thursday at the Freedom Hall, where he had his first fight against Tony Hunsaker. What a name that is! Uh, there'll be a special ceremony and then the burial and the procession on Friday. What a day that will be! Gene Kilroy it will be there. Maybe we'll speak to Gene in a couple of weeks. I hope you've enjoyed our tribute to Muhammad Ali this evening on this very, very special uh, boxing hour. Um, I, hope it, I, hope, I hope you've seen stuff there you've maybe not seen. Follow, following us is the face-to-face. -face. Yes, you know what it is. It's Big Vlad. It's Fury. It's the first time. And tomorrow night, it's going to be Enzo Macronelli. Saturday night, it's Lomachenko. Tonight has all been about one man. It's been a pleasure talking to you about him. Good night. Enjoy him. This is the regular dance that I use just before the shuffle. I'm moving and I'm moving and I'm jumping around. And just before you know it, split second, right after that shuffle, it's a good punch. I respect Ali for what he's accomplished as a fighter. Let me talk, fool. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> I'd like to ask you, at this moment, do you feel any fear of Joe Frazier? No, sir. Uh, no fear, never. My feelings are different from most fighters. I feel mostly the pressure. Uh, it's a little worrisome until the first punch is thrown, but never no fear. Knowing that everybody's here, 100, 300 million people watching, and everything is state, and all of this is involved. I'm where I want to be now. So all I have to do is listen to the people tell me about how great I am. I'm through talking. It's time for me to rest up now and uh, just take it easy. <laughs>